That's why I call individuals nowadays no longer peasants. They're fiat slaves. You're slave to something that was created imaginarily by another person putting a little dollar sign carrot in front of you. By the age of 65, you'll be able to retire and you'll be happy. But give me 40 years of your life. Luke Belmar, a 28-year-old entrepreneur, investor, and internet personality, who took the internet by storm with his success in digital advertising, e-commerce, and investing in crypto and NFTs. What e-commerce taught me was a few foundational skills. One is that marketing and distribution are more important than the product. If you have a great product, but nobody sees it, you're fucked. <laughs> Number two, sales. If you want to make money, you have to sell. Why are you so bullish on Pudgy Penguins? I'm an equity shareholder in Pudgy. It was not an investment in the project it was me betting on Luca. Do you think university is a scam? Absolutely. Imagine being in a scenario where I'm a business and I've convinced my entire population that in order to get a job, you have to go through me. Now you have all these motherfuckers that have more degrees than a thermostat and have no real experience. <laughs> if you can adapt your mindset to understand that money is a lagging indicator of success. The money that you get today isn't because you did something today. The moment you stop doing those things, then the future gets corrupted. How can someone become a contrarian investor? Develop your own investing thesis, understanding that investing isn't gambling. But when you don't overspend and you don't operate out of a place of greed or operate out of a place of need, you can start making better value-based decisions. Let's talk about investing. We have like Monad and different projects that are in that ecosystem. They're absolutely going to skyrocket. I see Monad going to like 30 to $50 billion valuation. Is there another crypto project or community that you're super bullish on? My answer to that is... Okay. Do you want to tell people how we got here today? It's, it's, a really cool story. it's a really interesting story. It's an interesting story. So long story short, you hit me up in the DMs and you're like, yo, let's chop it up on my podcast. I'd seen some of your clips. You'd had Luca, which is one of my business yep. partners uh, on here. I saw that you had some some dope people and I was like, yeah, but then you also had some people I'd, I'd met, you know, I'd talked a little bit of shit about me. So I'm like, eh, should I give this guy the time of day? And then you're like, bro, no, it wasn't. It's out of context. Don't take it too seriously. I'm like, all right, sounds good. Let's let's chop it up. So here we are today, bro. Yeah. Also, I'm super excited to have you, man. So maybe as a start, we are still in January 2024. Yes. It's the first month of the year. And uh, you wrote to your followers, 2024 is about getting wealthy in finance, health, mindset, relationships. This is the year of abundance in all area of life. Do you think it's possible to master all of these at the same time, especially when you haven't made it yet? Define made it. I define made it simply by being alive and by believing that you can become better by having hope. I think that that's the first step. I think if you just have the perspective that you have opportunity to develop, I think that it's possible, you know, because when you begin to think about wealth by definition, you know, you have this concept of people like, oh, this is a wealthy man or this is a wealthy family, but they're only talking about money. Mm -hmm. And wealth by definition isn't money alone, it's abundance. So what are the areas of your life that you're supposed to figure out or continue developing in order to develop this wealthy, well-rounded life? And this idea of, well, are you gonna always get to the place of mastery? No, right? There's always somebody that's going to have more money. There's always going to be somebody that's more ripped. There's always going to be somebody that has a better looking girl. It's just inevitable that there's always somebody that's going to have potentially some perspectives or some aspects of their life that are better than yours. But I think having that focus of not being one dimensional, mm -hmm. of being like, because you, you were telling me, you know, hey, dude, I was in business, I traveled the world, lived in all these super mega metropolis, and then I went back home and my, my health was fucked. Mm. So it's like, were you wealthy? You had all these experiences, all these things, but you had a foundational thing that wasn't in check. So I think just having the mental kind of parameters of understanding that you don't have to neglect your health in order to make money. You don't have to not talk to your mom or your parents for two years because you're hustling and grinding in the business. No, there's a place of balance and that's where I would define wealth. That's really interesting because I mean, if we're where we are today, we might have come across a podcast that uh, Naval Ravikant released in 2019 or 18, which is... Uh, the one with Joe? So basically, he did one kind of like on his own based on all his tweets, which is um, 
how to get rich without getting lucky without getting lucky right exactly and then he went on joe and then because and that's how i discovered him right through joe mm -hmm. and then i went to this first podcast which is three hours and a half and one of the key points there is money is not going to make you happy but it's going to help you get to a kind of stage of life where you can then focus on what really matters. And so what he advises is you should kind of make yourself almost miserable to make money as quickly as possible to then get onto the real things in life. But it's I not agree. really what you're saying. Well, I, I, I wouldn't say misery, but I would say, how can I make the most amount of money expending the least amount of time? Mm. Because time is the valuable asset that allows you to then explore other things. And if you're every single day expending 10, 12 hours just working to make money, then you're neglecting every potential other area of life that is beneficial. You know, I was doing some research as to how uh, the feudal ages kind of operated in the peasants and the feudal lords and the kings. Mm -hmm. And you begin to look at the work schedule of the peasants. These motherfuckers only worked 150 days out of the year. They didn't work 300 days out of the year like society teaches us today. So you have the peasants, the working class, by definition peasant means just working class, back in the day, only working half of the year. So here we are as fiat slaves working 300 days out of the year, assuming that money is the most important thing when it's all said and done, how much money do you actually need in order to live a wealthy, highly successful, fruitful life? Not a ton of money. You don't have to have a billions of dollars to get there. What's your answer to that? My answer to that is figure out a level of comfort that matches your lifestyle and it depends on everybody Absolutely. right and then don't overspend don't get to the place where you spend because you want to compare yourself to others and don't fall the, for the trap of consumerism if you become a consumerist you're always going to have to make money in order to spend hmm. but if you're a producer and not a spender then you're focusing on how can i create things of value in the marketplace that eventually allow for opportunity and money to flourish so essentially become a producer and live below your means, which is kind of true freedom. Because if you live below your means, you don't have to you, worry. You're never going to worry. Exactly. You talked about how do I make as much as possible by spending as least time as possible? What are a few answers to that? For example, in this podcast, again, with Naval, he talks about leverage, right? He talks about financial leverage, human leverage, so human capital. And then you have obviously the one that's like the best today. I mean, code and media. Yes, I agree. So I was actually with Meow, the co-founder of Jupiter Exchange at dinner today, and we were talking about what is the single most important uh, super weapon that an entrepreneur can have, and it's leverage, yep. right? And money gives you leverage. So my opinion is some people will value money more than I. What are these individuals? Usually the ones that don't have a lot of money. So I can give them money, in exchange for their time mm. and in exchange for their energy. So these people will help me accomplish my goals and my dreams. But now, like Naval says, it gets even crazier because now you can have little bots running around working 24-7. They don't get tired. They don't disobey. They don't clock out. They don't lie about their timesheet. They actually perform, and you can backtrack all of their effort and all of their work, and they can work 24-7. So Leverage your money, your resources, your connections in order to automate as many areas of life, both with people and AI bot tools in order to get to the next level. And this is what, we're, this is what you're doing? 100%. On. Yeah. Capital Club now has about 160 employees full time. About 65 of them are media distribution team. So I'll create a piece of content like this podcast and we'll probably get, I don't know, over, its, over the next year, 100 million views. So... I'll distribute that through short form content and I have people that do that. So instead of being like, okay, let me go out and create 50 pieces of content. I'm just going to create one piece of high value content and then allow other people through paying them to distribute it mm. and utilize their resources, their time, their energy, and their attention towards my goal. You said 160 people, right? Yeah. What's your approach because for me, what I really realized is, and it's com completely linked to this notion of leverage, but also fixed versus variable costs. Mm. And when I made this change in my businesses, it changed everything. F uh, Full-time employees versus contractors, or kind of like remote teams that are hired by the job versus by their time, right? And so if you do that, everything becomes variable and much less risky. Yes. How do you approach? Because I think it's more of an, 
you're what, 28, 29? Yeah, 28. That's like an approach that's much more like from our generation. Whereas, for example, the first company I built in London, like 25 people, I wanted, because I was in the old mindset, the old Swiss mindset. So I was like, I want Swiss quality, hmm. which is the freaking most expensive people on earth. <laughs> and I want them full time because I want the pride of saying, hey, I'm giving a job to these people and participating to their retirement and all that stuff. But then you have all this freaking stress, you know, and it was a consulting business. So it's like the worst type of business, unscalable. And then when you made, when I started to make the switch, I, was, I realized, man, like this is such a no-brainer. And then you can apply it to anything, right? So I, I look at it, I look at it a little bit different. I look at m when I pay people or when I hire people, I'm investing into them, mm. right? So I'm investing into their self-development. I'm investing into their progress. I'm investing into their education. I'm investing into their experience. So how foolish would it me would it be of me to? build somebody up for two years as a contractor or as somebody that's a freelancer, and then they're going to charge more for their services later on. They're going to go work for somebody else or they're going to go build their own stuff. I want to create an ecosystem where my people can grow within my organization. I It's so hard to find top-tier talent, but if you can find top-tier talent, I want them to come work for me and I want them to come work with me. So that means... It, you, sometimes you have to give them the freedom to operate and to create. Steve Jobs, I think, said, you know, the job of the CEO, the job of the business owners to recruit, mm. to recruit talent. And if you find A players, just get out of the fucking way and let them operate. So when you see Capital Club, when you see, you know, billions of views online, that's not just Luke. It's people that are super, super developed helping me accomplish certain goals and dreams. So I see it as, yeah, I have 160 full-time staff members. There is a lot of headaches and overheads and things like that, but they're all fixed cost. And that's one side. Two, I see it as an investment into them long-term. And then three, I never spend money that I don't have, right? And that's something that I always kind of pride my company of is we always underspend so much from what we make so that once again, like your personal expenses, you don't have that, oh, how can I get to the next paycheck? How can I, I don't want to live that way. Mm. I don't want to have to go and raise money or get investors because I can't make it. So I scale in proportion to, to our income. Do you think that A players stay or go on to leave and build their own thing once they realize how much leverage personal leverage they have, right? Depends, they... depends, because not everybody that's an A player is an entrepreneur mm. or not everybody that's an A player is a self-starter and not everybody that's an A player wants to go out and do their own thing or can take on the risk of going on and, you know, funding a business, building a business or being a CEO or an executive. Some people are just phenomenal videographers, right? Some people are just phenomenal human resource managers. Mm. Some people are just phenomenal accountants. So I just want to polish them, refine them, and then give them a value ladder of scalability within my organization. Eventually, that obviously for the high tier individuals leads to shares, leads to mm -hmm. options in the company. But that's just inevitable because the goal isn't to own 100% of zero, right? If you own 100% of something that's not Absolutely. worth anything, cool, you're the only guy involved, but you don't have shit. So sometimes you have to share, and that means splitting the pie so that the pie can get bigger. I'm all about sharing, bro. That's a, such a key concept, actually. And you have often when you start companies, you might have like two or three co-founders and then you have this ego at play, right? Who has more and like, why would we split equally? And you're like, man, first, it's all about not the what happened before. It's all about what happens in the future. And second, 33% of like something much bigger is, is worth much more than 100% of something much Smaller, absolutely. And, and, and it's also the energy and time thing, right? So if I have co-founders, now I have two, like I have more heads, absolutely. I have more energy, more time. And that's going, if they're the right people, that's going to accelerate growth and accelerate development, accelerate the achievement of your goals a lot faster. Absolutely. So you said you have 160 employees, you're 28, which is really impressive. You've done a lot of pretty amazing things in since probably in your 20s, right? Since I started I started I started my entrepreneurial journey in e-commerce in 2016. I started buying my first Bitcoin, $588, 2015, but it was, you know, tinkling and playing around, but my entrepreneurial swing and actually becoming a proper entrepreneur 2018. Where does this hunger and huge fire in the belly come from? When you when you're broke, Brother, you have nothing to lose, dude. I don't want to live a life of regrets. 
I, like I said, I was, I was talking with, I was talking with Meow and, and I said, dude, imagine being on your deathbed <laughs> and cool. Everybody thinks that you're successful. Cool. Everybody thinks that you have a lot of money, but you yourself, you look at yourself and you're like, oh, I could have done more or, you know, I didn't go for it. Dude, yeah. I just don't want to deal with that shit. I don't want to be in a situation <laughs> where I regret the fact that I gave up the gift of life to settle for mediocrity or to settle for less. And money, like we talked about, gives you access to opportunities. So talking about Switzerland, for example, if I didn't have money, I wouldn't be able to visit Zermatt. Mm. I wouldn't be able to visit Geneva. I wouldn't be able to visit these incredible, beautiful places. So I want to experience life. And in order to experience the fullness of life, I just have to work a lot harder than the average individual in order to experience more things. Absolutely. And the, 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 I don't want to have regrets. I mean, one of the key things that we're all looking for in our, probably in, in, in our life, right? But when you're a high achiever since early twenties, you, you're like, okay, how do I get happy, truly happy? And we, in the beginning, we kind of like mistakenly think that it's the money or the businesses or the girls or the, all this shit. Right. But then you realize, and I think it was, a, I think it's what, I think it was Andrew Tate who was saying that, which I don't agree with a lot of what he says, but he also talk, talks a lot of truth, right? And one of these things was something like when you work really hard on something, it's not about the result. It's knowing that you're giving your best yes. will make you happy, right? And will make you have no regret. And it's much less about the actual result of like, was I successful? rather than just, I gave my best, right? And if I give my best and I'm in the hustle, and actually you see it, right? When you build businesses, the best moments are when you're struggling yes. and you're having these goals. And when you kind of like reach these big milestones could be first million or first 10 million or another kind of business goal, right? You realize, fuck, that's it. Like that's, that's not like the thing that really makes you happy. So I think people, I actually, think people have like short-term goals and many times they attribute happiness to that achievement of that goal instead of that goal just being another stepping stone to their development and, and understand that dude life is life is long it's kind you know? of infinite it's an dude, infinite it's, game it's it's, yeah. it's always you always have to you're going to have to wake up the next day you're going to have to perform you know if you don't exercise you're going to lose your physique if you don't continue taking care of your family if you don't continue elevating if you don't continue leveling up what you don't use you lose and that's the thing about life is the people that are unsuccessful think that somehow you achieve one level of success and then you stop. Yeah. And then it's, oh, sit under a palm tree and chill. When, when I'll get it doesn't work million, that way. <laughs> when I get to my first million, I'll change my life, which I always say, if you would change your life when you reach a certain number, you should change your life already now because yes. it means that you're not going to be happy that day. That's not going to change anything. Yes. Right? And because it, it's a mindset play, bro. Yeah. It's a mindset play. And if you can adapt your mindset to understand one very basic principle, which is every single day, if you were to evaluate your life, like, like building a house, every single day you get to lay one brick. How are you going to lay that brick? Are you going to lay it with precision, accuracy, love, care? It's your house. Yeah. Like why you're not going to build it like shit. Like why would you build it like shit? It's where you're going to live. It's where you're going to reside. So every day I get to set up a block and not every day I do it right. Not every day I do it well. But if you go with the intention of being like, Hey, I'm responsible for my life. I'm responsible for my actions, the good stuff, the bad stuff. I get to establish and set this, this, this brick for today and understand that tomorrow I'm going to have to set the brick again. What the brick that I set up yesterday, right? In my life to continue building doesn't matter what I do today counts. And I, I made a post saying that, that money is a lagging indicator of success. Yeah, I saw that. And, and money yeah. is a lagging indicator of your efforts. So the money that you get today isn't because you did something today. We're here today, not because of what we did today, but because of what we did over the last couple of years that led up to this moment. Absolutely. And the moment you stop doing those things, then the future gets corrupted. You don't see it directly. That's the thing. And in the beginning, when you get successful, you, the first time, you can become complacent, yes. right? We talked about that with, with Luca on the podcast, actually. And we probably all made this mistake or I don't know for, for you, but like most of us. And then you're just there like, oh, if I just do nothing, it continues to freaking rain, right? Yeah, it Until happened it doesn't. to me, bro. It happened Until to me. it doesn't. Yeah. And then you get completely fucked. And then, yeah, anyway. So that's a super interesting one, actually. I think even uh, Jeff, Jeff Bezos talks about that. We're building, what we're doing today, he says in business is, 
going to happen in three years. So it's kind of like a, an extreme version and it, of and that. And it's also, it, it doesn't just apply to business and to life. If, I, if I'm the captain of a ship and I know the destination where I'm going, 99% of the time, I won't see the port of destination. Mm. I won't see it. I have to understand that if I just travel and I do what I'm supposed to do, eventually I'm going to get there. The captain doesn't say, well, just because I can't see the port of destination, I'm not going to leave. I'm just going to stay here and wait. No, no, no. With vision, right, and understanding and belief and knowing where you want to go, you set the trail, you set the path, and you work towards it every single day. You talked about these bricks, right, that you're kind of setting in a certain way. And you grew up in Argentina, yes, right? So we all grew up in different places. You grew up in Argentina, I grew up in Switzerland. And the place where you where we live, the environment, the culture we grow in, obviously is going to impact and limit our beliefs yes. and our self-beliefs. What's acceptable? What's not? What's possible? What's not? How does the young Argentinian, Singaporean, American, or even Swiss teenager, or let's say, you know, early 20, deprogram himself and sort of, as you'd say, like get out of, of the matrix to set himself up for insane success? So first is understanding that you're not what your religion tells you you are. You're not what your parents tell you you are. You're not what your friends tell you you are. In fact, you're not even what you tell yourself you are because you don't even truly understand your limitless potential. <coughs> so when you live in a situation whereby you're limited by the opinions and the insecurities and the projections of other people, what you're doing is you're limiting your potential and your growth for self-development. And the first part is understanding that you can become whoever you want to become. If you want to become successful, you will become successful. If you want to become rich, you will become rich. If you want to become literate, you will become literate. If you want to become well-traveled, you will become well-traveled. But you can't want something and then do another hundred things that are an antithesis or completely opposite to the goal that you want. So if I want to get rich, well, I'm going to have to pay the price. If I want to travel the world, I'm going to have to pay the price. And most people, they want something. They wish things, but they don't truly want them and then work towards them. So know where, know where you want to go, know what you want, and then don't want another other hundred things that are completely opposite to the achievement of that goal. So you don't have to have a ton of goals. Establish, you know, two, three goals, things that are easily executable and easily achievable. You don't have to go out and make a million dollars tomorrow. No, 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 relax. What is the next book about business and leadership that you should read? Mm -hmm. How should you be working out and eating and taking care of your health? How do you treat your relationship with your mom and your dad and your siblings? Well, that's going to easily translate into how you treat your business partners. So how you do the small things is how you do the big things. And like I said before, you just master building that foundation, building those little bricks day by day. And once you zoom back out, you'll see the beautiful creation, the beautiful artwork that you've built with your life. And it'll be a masterpiece for everybody to observe and be like, you know, this guy lived a great life. And maybe to kind of take off like of the magic, right? Oh, this person is so successful or this person is so fit. There's a process behind everything. Yes. There's a process behind everything. You want to get fit, though. like you can count your macros and train four or five, you know, times a week with go with a PT. You want to build wealth. There is a process to build wealth. There is, you want to build a business, you want to build a personal brand. There's a process behind every freaking thing. And it's kind of boring once you understand that because you're like, man, I'm just repeating the same shit every day. But that's where most people kind of fail because we're all looking for like the thrill and the, like the, you know, the thrill of the new thing. But actually all these things that we need to do to like get successful in one area or another of life is just based on processes. The process and in the preparation, you know, yeah. you have to, if you want to become a billionaire, if you want to become a millionaire, you have to develop the philosophies, the ideas, the habits, the work ethic of this type of persona, of this character, in order to then become that type of individual. Abraham Lincoln famously said, if I had six hours to cut down a tree, I would spend the first five sharpening the ax. So it's not about just the hustle. And it's not just about the grind. It's about the preparation. It's about the effort. It's about the dedication. Yeah, you see the you see Usain Bolt, right, on stage with the gold medal. You see Michael Phelps on stage with the gold medal. But you don't see jumping in the pool for fucking 10 years. You don't see having to run sprints in the middle of Jamaica in the heat for decades. No, 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 you don't see that. But it's easy to criticize, you know, 
the people sitting in the red carpet or standing on the red carpet from the motherfucking carpet of your own home when you have really nothing to do or you haven't accomplished anything. So it's understanding that it's a process, mm -hmm. understand that, that there's a lot of sacrifice, brother, involved in becoming somebody great. And it's going to require literally your life force energy to materialize these dreams into reality. It's really interesting that we talk about that because I wrote a bunch of things around that. Public rewards versus private practice. Mm. So I think it's today or two days ago, uh, there was Tony Robbins on a podcast called My First Million Podcast, which we all know. And he talked about the concept of it's what you do in the dark that puts you in the light. And then he gives the example. You gave some example. He gives the example of Stephen Curry, 500 shots a day. 3,500 shots a week, 180,000 shots a year, 2.7 million shots in 15 years of practice. Out of 16,000 game shots with 3,500 makes, he's one of the best of all time. Less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of his shots are seen in a game. Can you give some personal examples that show that success all comes down to obsession, sacrifices, practicing day in and day out, being consistent, patient, and persistent? Yes. I would probably attribute it at my, the beginning of my career. I would say e-commerce, mm -hmm. building an e-commerce business has taught me foundational skills that then translate into everything else that you do. So people say, well, I'm going to go do one job like sales, or I'm going to go do e-commerce. I'm going to go build a digital marketing agency, or I'm going to build a data analytics company. But what are the skills that you're learning? No, you're not just building a data analytics company. You're learning how to become a CEO. You're learning how to become a leader. You're learning how to become a well-polished individual. You're learning how to balance a checkbook. You're learning how to balance emotions. You're le learning how to balance your employees' emotions. So what e-commerce taught me was a few foundational skills. One is that marketing and distribution are more important than the product. Mm. So if you have a great product, but nobody sees it, you're fucked. It doesn't matter what business you're in. It doesn't matter if you're in crypto. It doesn't matter if you're in finance. If nobody knows what you have to sell, nobody's going to see it. So one of the essential skills that I learned is I need to learn how to garner, manage, and distribute my product. Number one. Number two, sales, right? Absolutely. If you want to make money, you have to sell. You have to sell. Now, in order to make money and sell, there's three areas that you need to master. Number one, you need to be the best at what you do. You don't want to get hired for being cheap. You want to get hired for being the best. Number two is what you do in sales needs to be in high demand. You don't want to be selling Eskimo, you know, an Eskimo ice. People are like, I can sell anything to, to, to anybody. Yeah, yeah, but that necessarily doesn't mean that you're going to be able to make a ton of money. So what you need to do is needs to be in high demand. You need to be the best at what you do. And then finally, you need to be irreplaceable, right? Can you be replaced by AI? Can you be, repl be replaced by somebody else? That's a question that needs to be answered. So I figured out in sales, I need to be the best at what I do. So if I'm selling a product or a service, people need to see me as a person of rep reputable standards. I need to be in high demand. So what I'm going to be selling needs to be in an evergreen niche. We saw so many, you know, hype niches or themes come up in crypto over the last couple of years, all sorts of shit, but they were just fads, right? It wasn't sustainable because it wasn't in high demand. And then finally, you need to be, like I said, the best of what you do in high demand, and you need to be irreplaceable. So can somebody replace you? So when you look at your skill sets, you need to ask yourself, well, what now can AI not replace? Mm, so what, what are you building today that, I, that, I, that, I, that AI can't replace? I was, <laughs> I was telling uh, recently uh, another, another podcast host, I, was, uh, I had the privilege to ha ask a couple of questions to one of the co-founders of OpenAI many years ago mm -hmm. before I launched Capital Club. And he told me, I asked him, hey, should I build an AI company? He's like, no, no, don't build an AI company. Build an AI-proof company. Mm. Build something that AI will never be able to replace. Because he's like, you're going to go building AI with who? Against all the MIT kids, Stanford kids, against all these nerds, all these think tanks. So like, you're going to have a very hard time. But if you can establish a moat as to what is uh, something that AI cannot replace, like self-development, community, personal growth, then you have the ability to sell in a way that AI can't replace. So <laughs> marketing, distribution, and sales are the two kind of beacons and pillars that I've uh, established as essential necessities for winning in business. And on the, top of, on the top of that, authenticity. For sure, bro. Because 
a lot of people think that being good at sales is being good at bullshitting, right? Hmm. The thing is, if you do that, you'll get people for the first round, but they'll never come back and you're going to ruin your reputation. What, Whereas, I tell, what I tell people just to follow that is if you sell something to somebody that they don't need, you're not a good salesman. You're a con artist. Mm. So when you sell, you need to sell ethically and you need to sell understanding that you're there to serve people. Absolutely. Basically, how can I provide you as much value as possible? And that's my problem. Not ask for anything <laughs> because you make the assumption that, but the smart people, they'll understand. They'll like, oh man, you're giving me something. I'll give you something back, right? It's all about providing so much value and doing it, you know, just, I'm not asking you for anything. Like, ideally, you're in a position where you don't even need, you're like, oh, this is all bonus, right? And again, I mean, I don't want to talk about Naval too much, but he's talking about using authenticity to escape competition. He's saying, basically, if you use authenticity, you're never going to have anyone that you're competing with because no one can compete with, your, with yourself, right? I agree. I mean, most people compete instead of creating. But that's because most people don't want to become the best version of themselves. They want to become what they perceive is a better version than themselves, which is what they see in somebody else be or what somebody else posts to be. When you have the same capabilities, you have the same potential, you just have to work for it extremely, extremely hard. And what I like about the internet is that the internet uh, doesn't take bullshit, right? So now as the creator economy begins to develop and as you know, people spend time online, things become more transparent. So people will be able to identify authenticity, they'll be able to identify truth, and then they'll be able to identify bullshitters. Probably blockchain will help in that because For you have sure. all these AI. For sure. Because one of the key problems now is like AI, we don't even realize most of us, but just for, we're in 2024, there is US elections this year. And uh, there was, uh, I think it was Raul Pal saying, during the US elections, you're going to have crazy arguments with your neighbors, your family members, people you love, just because AI, because of AI piece of contents that crazy, are, are going to be targeted at you to make you go crazy, right? And one thing where blockchain can really help is to prove whether all these piece of contents are actually true or not. The only issue with that, bro, is when you start playing with the humanization and the digitalization of personal identities. Mm. So it's like, oh, well, now we need to make sure that whoever's on Instagram or whoever's on Twitter is actually a real human. So now you have to submit your ID. And that's where shit gets kind of crazy. But I look forward to this future, bro. It's going to be fucking wild yeah. because now you don't even know who's commenting. For all you know, Zuckerberg's got all these motherfucking profiles running 24-7, just blasting comments to cause engagement, cause triggers. Call, and for all you know, it's just a troll farm. Yeah. It's wild. Absolutely. And it's happening. It's happening. I mean, it happens all the time. I think there was a there was a an intelligence company out of Israel called Project Judas, and they had uh, 30,000 Twitter accounts, and they would kind of control narratives through those Twitter accounts. And they're not real people. It's just a couple individuals. Now with AI, it's going to be super powered. And I agree with you, bro. It's going to fucking break a lot of people's minds, bro. It's going to be crazy, dude. Fuck. <laughs> I didn't even think that. I didn't even take that into perspective for the election, bro. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be wild. It was already, I mean, Trump won like thanks to data and social media, but it was not the, like advanced AI like that. So now it's going to be this, but on steroids. Wow, bro. So we talk about how much you need sacrifices, patience, consistency, persistence to make it right when you're starting to build a company. The problem is millennials and Gen Z, they're impatient as fuck. Because we live in a, in a world where we have everything at our fingertips, right? Coffee, food, dates, porn, anything we want just at the click of a button. But the really good things in life, a career, a relationship, a business, good health, wealth, they all come from daily compounding, right? Of small actions. What's your message to our impatient generation today if they want to be truly successful tomorrow? Be impatient towards the good things. Be impatient towards doing the good things every single day. Be impatient towards waking up and going to the gym. Be impatient to get on your sales calls and close those clients. Be impatient to pick up that book and read. Instead of being impatient about the results, be impatient about the input. 
because mm-hmm. you can't control the output. You can control how many seeds you plant. You can't figure out which seed is going to grow and how many how many apples are going to come from that apple tree. You can't control that. You can't control the day you're going to become a millionaire. If you say, I'm going to become a millionaire in one year, good luck, motherfucker, because if that year rolls around and you're not a millionaire, you're going to feel like shit. You're going to feel unsuccessful. But if you're like, my success is determined by my input and not my output, dude, being patient is a motherfucker. Getting that input, grinding, understanding that money, success is a lagging indicator. So hustle, do what you have to do on the input, and then let by natural law, which is a principle that applies to the universe, right? Action causes reaction. Input causes output. Focus on what you can control. Be impatient about becoming great. And the rest will play out. Mm. It's essentially what uh, Gary V says when he says uh, micro speed, macro patience. It's exactly that. Mm. Mm. That's very good. I'm Swiss. In Switzerland, we don't talk about money. Mm. We don't even know or dare to ask our parents how much how much they make really you don't do that no wow <laughs> that's how much taboo the topic of money is in switzerland at least that's might have changed cool. now but i mean i'm not old but like you know i don't know how much my father makes or how much he made like and you don't ask that right you talk a lot of about, about money and there is a lot of hate towards men who preach about making money mm. why do you think Openly talking about money and about making money is so important. Because money is just a tool. So I talk about money just like I talk about health, Mm. just like I talk about self-development and picking up a book and learning topics that you enjoy. Money is just a tool. Money is just a weapon that you utilize to accomplish your goals, but it's essential. And most people have no literacy when it comes to money. I I was doing some research as to how how the bible was translated into english when john wickliffe uh you know began uh translating the bible he was persecuted he was persecuted by the clergymen that would had the bible in latin and he was persecuted by the pope and he was persecuted by by the religious political powers why because at that time religion was the language of the elite and it's what kept people in slavery it's what kept people in bondage and in fear today now that you know, these spiritual texts have been translated and anybody can digest them. The tool of suppression is no longer religion, it's finance. So finance has now become the language of the elite. There's a reason the tax code is so complicated. There's a reason why they don't teach you money in school. There's a reason why these things are complicated. And it's not because they have to be complicated. It's because they're designed to keep you away from understanding that there are valuable parts of life that you need to master. So when you understand that language is also correlated to your ability to understand what my goal is to simplify these concepts so that people don't fear them and that they can understand them in a very basic way so that they don't have to depend on a tax accountant, so that they don't have to depend on somebody to tell them how to make money. A banker. Exactly. That takes massive they're all the, They're all the middlemen. <laughs> they're all the middlemen Absolutely. to God. In God, we trust. Absolutely. But go through me, motherfucker. That's what they tell you. <laughs> That's a really compelling one because... I mean the I mean in the banking sector it's if you start to for me like the 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 journey was since I was probably 21 or 22 when I started the first company I wanted to retire before 30 right whatever that means a certain number so I was like how do I retire before 30 and then we had some employees and we had you know a pension because you have to invest in a pension for your employees so I was like how do I, with my pension and with other people's pension, invest this money to retire as quickly as possible? And then you start from there to understand how the entire system is made that every pension... It's fucked, I mean, bro. in the UK, you have this self-investment pension plan, SIDB, I know. right? The government, the, the government invests it on your behalf. So, exa- so, fuck, so then bro. you understand the whole thing, which is... You read, you're like, okay, what? how do I start? I'm going to start about reading about timeless principle of investing. There's not, that, they all say the same, right? Uh, the little common sense of investing, the, obviously, uh, the, I mean, a bunch of these books. Also, Tony Robbins, he wrote a really good one, which is Money Master the Game and uh, Unshakable, and very simple ones after the great financial crisis to help millennials invest and to make them understand that it's actually not hard. It's just made harder by 
the ones who need to take a fees, right? And so you, you, just, you, need, you need the middleman to God. Exactly. And and the person that can be the middleman to God will charge you, you know, in order to get to heaven. And when you realize that you don't need a middleman in order to talk to God and you don't need a middleman in order to learn finance and you don't need a middleman in order to do anything, the middleman gets upset. And now the middleman not only controls finance, but they also control the school system because they're the ones that fund the school system and they're the ones that fund the universities and they're the ones that fund pharma and they're the ones that fund food. So now the entire narrative is controlled by this centralized group of people. That's why I call individuals nowadays no longer peasants. They're fiat slaves because you're slave to something that was created imaginarily by another person that controls you and is expending your life force energy and putting a little dollar sign carrot in front of you dingling and saying, by the age of 65, you'll be able to retire and you'll be happy, but give me 40 years of your life. It's fucked. So if I can, in some way, shape or form, kind of at least trigger these conversations for people mm -hmm. and be like, hmm, maybe let me, let, maybe, maybe let me look at the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. Maybe let me figure out why we got off the gold standard and who was actually involved in this Absolutely. process. Let me figure out why Satoshi's narrative of immutable money is actually compelling. And yeah, maybe I don't have to become a scholar when it comes to finances. Maybe I don't have to become somebody that actually understands the ins and outs of everything. But the last thing you want to be is ignorant because in ignorance, you can get fooled. And most people are ignorant. And what I think sometimes people get upset at is the fact that you're showcasing their ignorance. And uh, sometimes the truth hurts, mm. but I'm willing to offend in order to save a few. What do you think is the single biggest limiting factor that prevents most people from taking full control of their finance and their future? Most people blame others. Most people fear the consequences of being responsible for the good things and the bad things of their life. I often tell people everyone is self-made, but only the successful will admit it. Because the unsuccessful person, <laughs> they're self-made, yeah, but they won't absolutely. admit it. They'll blame somebody else. They'll blame the imaginary thumb of the government. They'll blame the race. They'll blame the color of their skin. But they'll never look at themselves and be like, what did you not do? Because everybody's quick to be like, oh, well, I am successful. I built this company. But what about when you fucked up? What about when you were inferior, when you were a loser? Did you take accountability for those things? And most people, I think, are just not comfortable with assuming that responsibility. So creating an ethos where we can be vulnerable, creating an ethos where it's okay to fuck up, where it's okay mm -hmm. to fail is going to revolutionize and change through authenticity, how people interact and how people talk. And what I often tell people is this, this fear of failure is induced into us. It's not natural. If you go to the school system, bro, imagine how fucked it is to go to a first grader and give them an F and tell them you're, you failed. Mm -hmm. Or you know what, because you didn't apply this, this, and this, you have to stay back with you know younger kids and you shame them. Bro, that's fucking degrading. So from the beginning, you're conditioned to not try. Because if you try, there's a chance that you're gonna be penalized. And you don't wanna be penalized, nobody wants to be penalized. Mm -hmm. And then that translates to high school, that translates to university, that translates to the workplace, that translates to your interaction in your entire life. You just wanna play it safe. And in that safety, it's all elusive because at the end of the day, you're going to die. So we all end up being in the same situation because we all are going to end up dead. So there isn't any safety because we're all going to end up six feet under. So if you're going to end up six feet under, there's nothing to stress about. There's nothing to worry. Yeah. I think it's called equanimity, no? This equanimity. Is the That's it, right? With the concept of like, don't look at the tree, look at the forest, right? Take a step back and then realize, man, why are we even stressing? I mean, and, and easier said than done, right? But it's, 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 well, it's, it, can't even be, it can't even be said and it can't be done. It needs to be felt. And the equanimity is the calmness of the soul. Equanimity means the calmness of the soul. So when you, like Miyamoto Musashi famously said, with your spirit as high as Mount Fuji, you will see all things clearly. Mm. And when you can elevate your perspective and you can see that what, what people are doing, what people think about you, your, your failures and your, and your wins, 
they're insignificant no when you can see fuck. it. Nobody cares, but brother. But before that, you need to go through the big failures <laughs> yes. and realize that nothing happened. Yes. Which most people will not go through because they're scared. Yes. And you're saying that one of the reason or the main reason they're scared is the education system where from young or so early on, it's basically black or white. Yes. Right? It's failure or success. Winner. Gold star or red marker with an F. Mm. Would you go as far as saying that, let's go into the education one because it's a very interesting one. The education system was created uh, by the Rockefeller Foundation mm. under the Prussian school system, which was the idea of creating factory working bots that don't question, they don't do anything except obey. That's why the school system resembles the industrial era. You raise your hand in order to use the bathroom. There's an assembly line. The bell rings. Therefore, that's your break. That's your cue. You have to be operating just within your little dynamic. You can't explore. Uh, you're not supposed to collaborate. You're within your little area of work. This is what you do. But it not only resembles the industrial kind of era, but it also resembles the prison complex, right? So you have the fluorescent lights. You have the locked rooms. You walk in a line. You go to the yard one hour of the day. And you only do it when the bell rings. Dude, it's can, can so I, can I ha just, when everybody <laughs> clips it, all you have to do is look at what a cafeteria looks like in the United States school and look at a cafeteria prison. They look the same. So everything is conditioned Fuck, from, the, yeah. from the moment you're young to absolutely <laughs> create and prune you into being a fiat slave. Which we all follow, right? We even getting out of this mindset of, and again, my Swiss side will be like, you don't have to be an entrepreneur to be like, it, it's not only about being entrepreneur, right? You can be a consultant and be happy. You can be a- You can even right? be an employee. It's, 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 not even, it's not even about that. It's, it's about understanding that what you've been conditioned to believe is a bullshit. That's... What you've been conditioned to, to feel about reality, what you've been conditioned to understand is true, is not true, and that the systems, the beliefs that you've been given are not yours and that you're not bound and limited to these things in order mm. to become an individual that achieves greatness. Greatness isn't what Luke Belmar tells you greatness is. Success isn't what Luke Belmar tells you success is. What is your symphony of success? When you hear success, right, what does that mean to you? What does that look like for you? It looks different for you. It looks different for me. Mm. But pursue that path. Most people know, hey, I want to pursue something. I want to become somebody. But then because of the fear of failure, the fear of judgment, the fear of insecurities, and shame on all these motherfuckers online that talk shit. Because the last thing you want to be doing is criticizing and insulting somebody for trying. When Absolutely. We're, when, we're, when, Absolutely. We're, when we're all just trying to make it. So why yeah. are you trying to hold the brother down? You know what I mean? <laughs> what about... Crazy. What about your parents? Because obviously your parents, I mean, I'm saying, when I say your, I mean like people's parents, mm. right? My belief is that most parents only, if, even if they don't know how to communicate it, they truly love their kids. Yes. And they want the best for their kids, right? But just because they want what's best for them, they don't know what is best, right? Just because somebody loves you doesn't necessarily mean they know what's best for you. And what I always tell people is, when, when, with your parents, people that have invested their life force energy into nurturing and raising you, especially if they love you. If they don't love you and they treat you like shit, fuck them, right? That's my point of view. Mm. But if they've actually empowered you, they've worked hard to help you elevate, they want to see what's best for you, prove them wrong, right? If they don't want to see you elevate, prove them wrong with your actions. Mm. Your, your parents aren't going to be upset if they see you waking up early if they see you pursuing your dreams, if they see you being productive, if you're not doing anything, you're just playing Fortnite all day, being a lazy piece of shit, they're gonna go. Be, they're gonna start questioning, well, what what is this person doing with their life? And rightfully so. But I think when parents also understand, and they a lot of them do, that you're actually being productive and you're putting forth a plan towards success, a lot of them will support it. Yeah, because ultimately they just want to, you to be happy, and yeah. they'll feel it and they'll see it if you're yeah. happy in. In whatever you're and so, trying. And you have to sell them on it. It goes back to what we yeah. talked about. You have to sell them, just like you have to sell your girl on staying with you, just like you have to sell your customers on, on hanging around. You have to sell sometimes your parents on them allowing you and blessing you to pursue different areas of life. And worst case, if they still don't want it, there is still the possibility of saying, hey, I'll find a whatever shit job or 
just to not depend on you financially anymore so I can do my own thing and you don't have a say anymore, right? You know what? You know what's funny? It was uh it was the Thanksgiving of 2017 and I was remember in 2017, I think everybody was talking about crypto or yeah. Bitcoin and it went Absolutely. up and then it tanked yeah. or some shit. Yeah. Uh I think that was the, that's where like the entire culture of hey during Thanksgiving everybody talks about crypto and everybody tells their grandma to buy. I think it came from the 2017 bull run. But we were going around the table and and my mother asked me uh <laughs> she said, "What are you grateful for?" Right? My 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 mother always asks that during Thanksgiving. "What are you thankful for?" And I said, "I'm thankful for Bitcoin." And they laughed at me, right? They scoffed me. But last week I sent my my mother a Bitcoin, right? And she no longer cares about whether she scoffed me or whether she thought Bitcoin or my gratitude towards it was a good thing or that I'm being thankful for it. She's just happy now that I'm successful. And now she gets to partake in that success. So sometimes you have to eat some shit. Sometimes mm. you have to understand that your vision is your vision and it was given to you. It wasn't given to your parents. So you don't need their validation. You don't need their approval. But if you're still under their household and you still you know, want their blessing, then prove them wrong through your actions and be diplomatic through a process of selling them into your vision through action, dedication, and respect. Applies again, this applies a lot to actually sales in business, right? Yes. Because let's say your clients are big corporations, so there's a lot of politics in there. Sometimes you know exactly what they need, but if you tell them what they need, they'll tell you to fuck off. Yes. So you will sell them what they want to hear, and once you got the project, then you come and you say, forget all the shit that I told you, now we're going to do the real deal, right? And it's always, it's, it's sales. It's just sales. Like everything is sales. It's true. <laughs> it's crazy. And if you can't if you can't sell your mama on letting you start an e-com store, then how are you going to sell anybody on giving you a million dollar check to go start a business? Or you're going to how are you going to go sell something that's high ticket? Or how are you going to sell anybody on anything else? Yeah. Everything starts in the basics, right? Everything starts in the beginning. And if you can be diplomatic with your family and bring them onto your vision, so be it. But at the at the same time, the path of success and the path of entrepreneurship and the path of greatness is lonely and you have to be willing That's so to true. be alone in the process to getting to the top and i realized in my life and my pursuit my pursuit my main perspective in life wasn't to become successful my perspective of life has become to pursue truth and when i ta told god hey i will sacrifice my family my relationships even my life for the pursuit of truth then that commitment and that dedication carried me through any insecurities any doubt, any loneliness, and eventually all these things played out well. So you would say that you're still lonely? No. Often? I am I'm because, I, because I can I can be alone and not be lonely because I'm with myself. How do you get to that stage? Because for spend me, a, was, spend a lot of when you're in the car, turn off that motherfucking radio. Be in your thoughts. Ask yourself, why is it that you do what you do? Ask yourself, why do you wake up in the morning and do what you do? Why is it that you pursue the goals and the dreams that you pursue? Have these conversations. Be comfortable in your own skin. If you're uncomfortable, ask yourself, why is it that you're experiencing these things? Ask, why is it that you are in a situation where, uh, where, you, where you don't like to be by yourself? Because if you are with yourself, it doesn't mean you have to be lonely. You don't need other people. Because when you're on your deathbed, boot, nobody's going to be there. It's just you, yourself. Figuring out, did I live a successful life? Mm. Did I do what I say I was going to do? You can't point fingers. You can't say, oh, because this person said this or this person said that. No, 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 no. You're fully accountable for your life. And when it's all said and done, it's all up to you. So why not live that way? What do you do concretely with that? Do you meditate? Do you pray? I spend a lot of time just thinking. So you have like in your agenda or calendar, which is probably crazy full. No, it's empty. You have some, it's empty. You oh, have like some. so empty, bro. It, there's like nothing on my calendar because that, that was like, uh, that was like my perspective. Like I just have like my regular calls for the week, which is like my regular calls. But besides that, as the creative in the business, I can't have a schedule. Absolutely. Okay. I need to be able to create an environment where I can just free flow. And it's not for everybody, but in my space, it's just like, empty schedule and just spend as much time thinking as much time in my thoughts and as much time as possible questioning my actions so that I understand why I'm actually doing what I'm doing. You talked about 
pursuing truth mm. and thinking basically back to what you've done. You you went to college? No. Briefly? Dropped no? out. Yeah. Dropped out, right? I want to die. I went to bit. multiple universities, taste, tested different things, one quarter here, one quarter there, but it never suited me. Uh because the teachers were kind of losers, and I t and I sensed that from the, from from the get go. Oh, I'll tell you, bro. I, I had two teachers. Two teachers convinced me that school was shit. My first one was my, a communications teacher. Didn't know how to fucking talk. So I was like, "How's this person going to teach me communication?" And then the second one was in an, at the a second university, an international business professor that had never been overseas. So yeah. I'm like, "How are you going to teach me Absolutely. how to be how to become an international entrepreneur?" You're talking about macroeconomics, microeconomics, but are you telling me about culture? Are you telling me about how to interact with with Chinese people when I actually go to China and how how to broker a deal? It's come, you can't learn that unless you're there. <laughs> so I was like, "Fuck this! I gotta go learn this. Actually, get in the trenches." Yeah, complete. I mean, for me, I was kind of also the, the motherfucker in the in. I I completed the whole like bachelor, but I was always thinking, especially when I did my masters, I did two inter internship, three months each in between bachelor and master. I go do my master, and I realized that. I have more work experience after six months really? of freaking internship than the PhD professor in front. And we had an entrepreneurship class, 14 sessions. And at the very end of this entrepreneurship class, 14 sessions, she, she's like, hey, anyone has question? And I'm like, she had done a PhD in entrepreneurship, never built a business. And she was an entrepreneurship professor. And I'm like, do you really believe we can teach entrepreneurship? <laughs> like, and... Same. I always thought, man. So like, fuck, bro. Like, I I don't disrespect you, maybe because of my Swiss values, but I'm like, how can you teach me something when you've never freaking done it before? Yes. Right. And if you think about it, the education system is completely outdated today, right? Yes. And so there is a, I mean, different takes on that. Do Do you think university is a scam? Absolutely. Because it's a business, right? The university is a business. So in certain countries, you have public university, but somebody's paying for it. Maybe it's the government, but somebody's paying for it. In the US, university is expensive as fuck. Mm. Imagine being in a scenario where I'm a business, right? And I have convinced my entire population, right? That in order to get a job, you have to go through me. Once again, it's the middleman to the job, to the job, to the workforce. It's the middleman. So now you're like, well, I can't develop skills. I need a degree. And you have all these motherfuckers that have more degrees than a thermostat and have no real experience. <laughs> so then they go and you hire all these super intelligent dudes, quote unquote, but have no values. They have no self-esteem because they haven't actually accomplished anything. Not only that, they're super inexperienced and they're not even worth having around. And they're in, they're entitled. They're arrogant. That's true. They think that w because you took a couple tests in that's school, true. that you can, bro, the marketplace will, will fuck you up, dude. Actually, because you're being told at university, you are the leaders of tomorrow. You are the leaders of tomorrow. And then you end up with so many people with papers, right? With university pa papers that we have this thing called academic inflation, where you've gone through all these studies, you might have taken a loan, and then it's, it's hard to find a job. And if you find a job, the job is going to pay you like shit. No one will give a fuck about you, right? So... Yeah, it's true. Like, I mean, I would also argue that when you start your first company, especially if you're young, like no one gives a fuck either, right? And it's hard. But but what, why? And it depends, right? Like you have you have certain things that are that are that are worth learning. But here's the thing, even bro, even medicine. Let me talk to you about this medicine shit. Sometimes I would go into these lecture halls. I went to I went to this veterinary school once to kind of have an understanding as to their nutrition because I was very curious as to who ran the nutrition classes. And I figured out that Purina, right, the food, the dog food company, which is basically poison for animals, they were sponsoring all of the university's food supply in exchange for running their nutrition class. So they're conditioning all the doctors to say, hey, if you're going to sell food to your dog, make sure it's our brand. So they're being brainwashed into one, feeling like they're sources of authority to not realizing that information is tailored and curated by the person that is funding that university. And three, just look at the statistics. There's a reason why the second or third leading cause in the United States of mortality is medical malpractice. 
It's doctors not knowing what they're doing. And that's not even getting into COVID. <laughs> which would be, <laughs> which would probably be like a three hour <laughs> podcast on its own, but linked to the. Oh, but go, the, one second, going back to the, go, going back to the, the medicine with the, the veterinary, uh, um, nutrition class that I snuck into the Purina, uh, professor told there was, I think about 250 veterinary students, all white jackets, proud of their jobs, recite the following animals don't need new nu- uh, food. They need nutrients and our food gives them nutrients. And they told them, chant this, chant this. So now you have all these highly educated kids kids being told what is true what is not true and once again the source is controlled by the few it's so fucked yeah yeah, and like i mean we talked about it before but i got massively fucked by the yeah pharmaceutical industry and uh it's basically just i mean i was 23 starting to like lose a bit of hair you know very entrepreneurial so problem solution i'm building my first company i don't have time for this shit right ah there's this advertisement everywhere about like these pills that you can take that's just going to make you thousands of success stories. Probably works. Like I can trust, you know, it's been it's a pharma it's industry. It's proven. It's the pharma industry. The, so studies you, are, the studies are legit. I mean, actually it works, right? But you go to these pharma, these centers and then you have this woman with white clothes, right? And you're like 22, I'll trust them. Like they're doctors. And then they sell you these freaking pills which for me, like completely destroyed me, like completely had like cognitive impairment, visual problem, crazy anxiety, crazy depression. I became suicidal. It was fucking horrible. Like, and I mean, an amazing learning because then, as I said before, like, how do you get out of that when the entire first industry is kind of like rigged against you because you're just trying to sell recurring revenue, right? Bro, Not pharmaceutical is just yes, that. How do I, it's a business. How do I hook people forever on pills, whether antidepressant, sleeping pills, Hair loss pills. Birth control. Birth control. Absolutely. Crazy. Crazy (laughs) shit with the birth control. What's your take on birth control? I mean... And a woman would tell you... For example, in Asia, women will are very against that. And I always tell them, I completely understand you. Because my experience with these pills is what I... The reason I got fucked is because it acts on your hormones, right? Yes. And so if you think, like, logically the birth control is actually acting on your hormones. So like, I would never ask you to take this shit because it can only be bad. I even heard some story where there were women who would get married to someone uh, when they're on the pill, right? And because the pill is acting on their hormones, so they are attracted to a certain type of men, but the day they're off the pill to get and they, kids, and they lose, they the lose attraction. attraction. It's insane, exactly. dude. It's insane. Yeah. But hey, <laughs> hey, you, hey, your little 13-year-old daughter has acne. Let's put her on birth control to regulate her emotions and regulate her hormones and regulate her mood. And now you put 100 million women in the United States on birth control. And now what happens? It's usually a pill, which means what? 90% plus of it doesn't get digested. It goes to your urine. That estrogen goes into the water. Now you I have a, we're going. now you have a, now you have a hundred million women urinating highly estrogenated urine into the water supply, and water is just a recycled commodity. But the treatment plants they don't treat for estrogen, neither do they treat for testosterone. So now you have all these feminized men drinking this tap water, and you're asking why Alex Jones is realizing that the frogs are gay, and, <laughs> and it all comes down to the fact that it's a big chemical warfare through the water and through the monthly recurring revenue of human beings. It's so insane. You dude. tweeted the, uh, I laughed a lot, but it makes so much sense. We're drinking bottled water, right? You said tap water is for NPCs. No tap water, no porn, no devil music. Can you elaborate? I mean, the, they're the three things that attack your mind, right? So you're going to be attacked your mind through your eyes because it scars your memory. You're going to be attacked through the vibrational frequencies of music. So the, pro- the, 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 the messages that are being propagated. And then finally, through the chemical warfare that attacks your mind. So calcifying your pineal gland. We can talk about vaccinations, crossing the blood brain, brain barrier and adding heavy metal toxicity to your brain. Everything is designed to impair your ability to think 
impair your ability to reason and impair your ability to develop cognitive thought that actually questions the system. That's why, that's why, that's why people are just walking around like NPCs. They're walking around by default. They're walking around slow. And that sometimes I don't judge them, you know? It's like, okay, you're just so intoxicated with porn. It's fucking up your brain, frying your brain. You're so intoxicated uh, with tap water and fluoridation. I completely get it. And now you're adding all this demonic, super controlled narrative music that is now conditioning to you, fuck bitches, take drugs, and hoe around because that just happens to be the cool narrative. Mm. So no devil music, no porn, and no tap water to me are the essentials of living a very good, clean, healthy life. Do you think there is a, an actual agenda beho- behind all of that? Absolutely. Or do you think that because we live in a um, world where profits at any, at any cost, Companies make decisions without kind of even understanding no, it's, the, it's the all, consequences. All you know? controlled. All controlled. Even look at the example of, for example, you look at these big companies like Pornhub. They were doing like secret like spy interviews with with some of the some of the executives. And for example, they would every now and then on the main feed or however these things work, they would add a transgender video. Just simply to add that in case you know people want to test or experience a new thing. So they're controlling even sexuality at that narrative. Water, well, water and food have always been utilized to control people, whether it's by limiting the water supply or by poisoning the water supply. So if you can dumb people down to control them, why wouldn't you? And you begin to realize we have all the shootings, we have all the initiations to gangs, we have the murders, uh, we have families that are being broken apart because of people that cheat. Where are they getting their source of information? Who are they archons? Who are their role models? Musicians? Celebrities? Celebrities are some of the most useful motherfuckers in the entire planet, but they're being used as puppets mm. for the narrative. So one of the ways to get out of all of that is one way or another, would you would say? Freedom of thought, bro. Freedom of thought? Asking yourself, why is it that you're doing what you're doing? Questioning everything, dude. You have to question everything, even if it's uncomfortable. Why am I listening to this music? Why, out of all the songs in the world that I could pick, why am I listening to fuck bitches, fuck hoes? Like, out of everything. If I could drink clean water, why do I choose to drink the tap water that the government is telling me is healthy? So you can look at this, this commercial of uh, the mayor of New York City drinking tap water, and he's like, mm, New York City has some of the best tap water in the world. And he runs it like an ad or a commercial. I'm like, dude, this is so weird. <laughs> so fucked. And then you look at the music industry and a lot of artists and record companies, they actually have contracts with prison complexes because most prisons are private companies that actually monetize uh, and they have quotas of how many inmates they're supposed to have. So now you're pushing gang music. Now you're pushing violent music. And all these things have real world consequences that are just filling up the prison. That's why America is supposed to be the land of the free but we have 2.5 million people in prison. That's not normal. One of the things that's really worth questioning, the fiat system. Crazy. Obviously, the crypto podcast. I mean, very crypto focused. <laughs> so we have to talk about that. But before talking about crypto, more generally, one of the ways that people who don't like crypto can kind of escape the fiat system is, I mean, not really the fiat system, but at least their nine to five and the rat race is investing, right? And I saw you publicly um, said you were investing about 10% of your net worth in Meta Mm. around October, 2022, so near the bottom, yeah, basically, which obviously in hindsight is the bottom, but, you know, crazy high fear. Every time there is a market crash or we think, oh, maybe it's 2001 happening all over again, like the mega bubble, everything goes down 90%, it's the end of the world. So you did that. Today, the S&P 500 is about near all-time high, NASDAQ not too far. Meta all-time high. Meta all-time high. So your call was definitely the right one. And for me, the really interesting fear, uh, important concept for people to understand, and crypto will come into that, but it's the concept of being a contrarian investor. 
which is the most important concept in investing, right? If you want to make money, obviously it's easier said than done. How can someone become a contrarian investor? Develop your own investing thesis and understanding that investing isn't gambling. So when I bought Meta at 80, 90, hundred dollars, that was, I average within that price range. I wanted those prices. I knew that it was a fair value for the, the company. So I said, okay, I'm willing to buy it at this price. It's not because I'm a genius, but I looked at the fact that Meta was at 2016 prices. They're not the company that they were in 2016. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't I pick up a fuck ton of Meta stock? I'm looking at MSRT. I'm like, okay, MicroStrategy is absolutely going to skyrocket because this guy is going to buy, we're talking about Michael Saylor, he's going to, he's all in on Bitcoin. And we know that Bitcoin is going to go to all time highs. <laughs> maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but eventually. Yeah. So all you're basically buying is a leverage play right there. And then you look at uh, Carlos Salinas, who's uh, one of the richest guys from Mexico. And he said, he was asked, well, where's your liquidity right now? He said not to. He said MicroStrategy, he said Bitcoin. So I said, who am I to oppose this guy's thoughts? Uh -huh. That was my thesis for there. And now my next thesis, which is going to play true eventually, is PayPal. PayPal is at a 2017 price point. They generate a billion dollars net uh, every single year. They One of, one of every four e-commerce companies uh, processes through PayPal, and it's still absolutely a behemoth. But it's at 2017, 2016 prices, so why wouldn't I pick it up? The risk-reward ratio just happens to be so much higher. So, you know, in 2000, 2023, I only made 11 investments. I only made 11 trades. I don't trade like a, like a savage. I'm not out here on the charts every single day. I want to make few high sizable bets that have long term plays attached to it. So I don't want to be day trading because everybody knows that day traders lose. Absolutely. Everybody knows this. And once again, we talk about the productivity, the lagging indicator. I'm willing to sit on a position one, two, three, four, ten 10 years for one very simple factor. Swing trades. Yeah, yeah, for one very simple factor. I don't need the money. Yeah. Right? So when you don't overspend and you don't operate out of a place of greed or operate out of a place of need, you can start making better value-based decisions. And once again, I once again, I could have picked any stock, but it was something that I'm familiar with. I'm familiar with Meta. Yeah. I'm familiar with Shopify. Why? Because I come from an e-commerce background. Yeah. So Q, Q4 is rolling around. I know everybody's spending money on Facebook ads. So I know that Q1 reporting about Q4 is going to be absolutely phenomenal. They're going to crush their, their reports. And they did because they did every single year prior. So why wouldn't they do it this year? And it happened. Shopify took off. PayPal took off. And well, no, PayPal didn't take off. Shopify took off. Meta took off. My, Microsoft took off. I made a massive $4 million purchase of uh, Microsoft uh, stock the same day that Microsoft announced a $10 billion investment to OpenAI. I said, well, I can't invest in OpenAI, but $10 billion is a lot of fucking money. So they're not just paying for whatever it is that they're investing in. They're probably investing in infrastructure, teams, uh, uh, scalability, operations. So I was like, this is a very good proxy, right? for me to invest into open AI because they technically own it now. And once again, Microsoft strategy, or excuse me, Microsoft uh, passed Apple for yeah, yeah, a yeah. couple days yeah. as the most valued company in the world. Yeah. And that V reversal was absolutely savage. And what's really interesting is it's not rocket science. And we talked about that the other day. I was with Alex Vanevik here for two hours and we talked about, it was more applied to crypto investing, but Essentially, being a good investor is you rely on a few pretty simple heuristics, which is, hey, we're back to the same price as a few years ago, but probably like they've been doing a lot of work, so they're probably much more advanced. So it's a good opportunity. And then, as you said, if you are experienced or an expert in a certain industry, you obviously, because you spend that much time, <clears throat> going to have conviction. And once you have the simple heuristic coupled with your conviction, then it makes the whole thing much easier. Yes. And that's why for us, for both of us, Bitcoin and crypto is such a no brainer, right? It's, hey, look, I mean, it was more like a year ish ago, like, oh man, it went back below previous all time high, or like even like, you know, the all time high of 2017, we were 
below that crazy you're like what the fuck or like a 900 a 900 dollar ETH? ETH, exactly you're like this is crazy so it's 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 just yeah it's basically that it's some simple heuristics and um and the conviction the conviction is the most important thing and again and and, and not just that but it's understanding that first of all you're not always going to catch the bottom and you're not always going to sell the top and i don't make my i don't work or invest in order to pay for my bills, right? I invest to multiply my money. I have businesses, I'm making money in the real world that I get to deploy. So if my investment goes down 10%, 20%, 30%, I can stomach the drawdown. I can stomach certain losses just for the simple fact that I don't depend on trading in order to pay the bills. And if you're going to trade out of a place of desperation, you're always going to get fucked. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So you said you're doing this sort of swing trade, right? One, two, three years in the crypto context, probably is going to be like a year and a half, two years swing yes. trade. And that's a really interesting one because you said, I think it was on a podcast I saw, you said, I bought crypto, I made my money, I sold, right? Which sounds so simplistic, but most people in crypto in their first cycle, they make a shitload of money and then yeah. they round trip everything and they get wrecked, right? Yeah. And so you have these like very simplistic, almost cold, rational approach to crypto instead of following the traditional, you know, we're all going to make it, hold all, and then you get fucked. Can you tell us more about your approach, how you approach the crypto cycles to minimize the chances of round, -trip pick, round tripping all the money you made and get wrecked? Well, I got round tripped in 2017, right? So <laughs> I did a, I did we'll a, there. We'll get there. I, I did 160 or 180 X and I lost it all. And at the top, I was out here pulling loans. I, I, I went savage, right? And I, I did it the wrong way. And I was like, I'm not doing this again. Mm. But crypto is going to come back. So what do I have to do? I just have to have more money in order to deploy it. So uh, I bought Ethereum during the COVID crash. It just made complete sense. I bought Bitcoin during the COVID crash. And then I started playing because I was involved in DeFi summer of 2019. I said, bro, DeFi is going to go crazy because I was part of the ETH ICO or the, the ICOs in, on the Ethereum chain in 2017, mm -hmm. where basically you had the MetaMask and you would have to send ETH to an address and you would get their tokens in return. That was kind of how ICOs worked. So when, you know, smart contracts started rolling out, DeFi started rolling out, I'm like, whoa, I'm going to pay attention to this thing. And then obviously I just happened to be on in Clubhouse when CZ was talking about PancakeSwap and mm. the Binance Smart Chain and how he was wanted to compete with uh, with Ethereum. And then this motherfucker had beef with, uh, with the founder of Uniswap. And I'm like, bro, when CZ's got beef with somebody, he's going to try and take them down. And what vehicle was the competition to Uniswap? PancakeSwap. So I just made a very big purchase of PancakeSwap, purchased 1% of the supply, and it worked well. And so you're, that's really interesting, the strategy, because a lot of people, they think oh, I can put like a, a, a thousand bucks in crypto and make a, a thousand X, or I'll put like 500 or hundred bucks in like 50 different crypto and I'll become rich, right? But this never works. The strategy is more yours and it was the same with me. You round trip once, then you're like, I need more cash. So I need to build a business or have a job to get this cash to then once I have the right conviction and the right timing, Luck is when preparation meets opportunity, right? Yes. I'm going to invest at that moment and then like I'm going to wait two years and make a shitload of money. But because I invested a good amount of money, right? It's probably a better solution ra rather than what most people think, which is, oh, I'm just going to make, you know, become a millionaire overnight with like a random meme coin. I mean, obviously you can make a lot of money with meme coins, but like it's, there is, a few really huge success stories, but there is you know, thousands that are not talked about, which is people who lost everything. Whereas like you can have a more rational approach, which is, hey, how do I have a business generating cash? And I reinvest that. It's traditional investing applied to crypto, except it's kind of like on steroids, right? Yes. And in, in, my, in, in my view, it's, you know, the first bull run, you get kind of round tripped. Mm. The second one, you're following the calls on Twitter, but you're a little bit more clever. Uh, and then my third one, which is the one that we're coming into right now, I, I'm not even going to like looking at the charts, trading view, looking at CoinGecko. I'm not even doing that. Now I'm building. 
right? Absolutely. So that's Absolutely. so you realize that that the upper side and the leverage in reducing your risk is in being involved in the ecosystem. So I went from being a gambler to being somebody that was like, hey, like I can invest in this. I got some money. I'm doing well. To now being like, okay, but well, the infinite upside is to actually be involved in the ecosystem, be involved with the projects. And I think that that's like the natural progression of a crypto journey. Absolutely. And it, bro. But here's the thing. The thing I love about crypto is that the 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 upside is so good for the amount of effort and work that people put in because it's one of the because, highest leverage. Bro, it's, the leverage is ever. unbelievable, yeah, yeah, dude. You could you could be yeah. a VA on a Discord server and be absolutely loving your job, <laughs> making money, getting alpha, getting calls, getting integrated with communities, getting exposed to new projects. The upside is so great when the time is right. Now is the time. Now the time is right. I, I've been telling people, dude, get in the crypto sure. space, start building, get involved, meet founders, uh, understand the future trends. So a couple of the future trends are uh, the enhancement of the Ethereum virtual machine. So basically ba building layer ones on top of Ethereum, because now Ethereum is kind of monolithic. It's your it's kind of like your settlement layer. So you have like Monad and Monad, different, yeah. different projects that are in that ecosystem. They're absolutely going to skyrocket i see monad going to like 30 to 50 billion dollar valuation it's gonna be absolutely nutty prediction but what that'll happen about the project it's top tier why the founders bro they understand what people want in crypto people want high frequency trading with no fees mm -hmm. with low fees so you, they create an ecosystem where they can bundle all of that and then deploy it to your settlement layer and now instead of having everybody pay what fucking a hundred dollars worth of ETH in order to have a, a transaction go through, now you create an experience that is actually nice. That's why Solana has become so popular. Absolutely. It's because it allows high frequency trading. And one of the founders of Solana was very specific. He said, we built this product specifically for people that want to trade, you know, $5 on a specific trade or $2 or $10. You can't do that on Ethereum. Mm. That's why Binance Smart Chain became popular, but Binance Smart Chain is centralized. Now Binance has uh, like this government oversight, so that's kind of dwindling. Uh, B, the BUSD is no, really, no, no longer a thing. So now you have Solana taking over. Solana is absolutely crushing, not only because of Solana, but because they've done really good at building products around it, like the Phantom Wallet, which is the best wallet that exists right now. You have Jupiter Exchange, which is kind of like your ability to, to trade in the best DeFi format possible. So now you see a lot of people that are building, making crypto relevant to what people actually want. The reason Robinhood was dope was because you could hop in there on your phone and in 10 minutes buy a stock. Absolutely. User experience, which in crypto is so bad. But, but it's getting better. It's getting better. It's getting on, super good. On Solana, you said you had dinner with the, the founder of uh, Meow, yeah. Jupiter, right? What do you think of the exchange? Do you think it's going to take over Uniswap? Do you think it's just for other kind of people? Yeah. yeah. Jupiter exchange is going to absolutely demolish. I was talking with him about his future plans, and I can't go into it, but the vision is beyond just your traditional, hey, I'm going to be out here buying and selling shit coins. The dude wants to introduce foreign exchange mm. remittance. He wants to basically put all tokenized assets on, on and inside through the Jupiter exchange. Uh, NFTs, DEX, it's going to be a behemoth. Uniswap will not be able to compete. No chance. There's another project we have to talk about. Tell me. You wrote, the e-com kids came into crypto and took <laughs> over Web3 in one year. Stop fading the penguins. We, I mean, obviously I had Luca on the podcast. I also had James Wu, who is one of the key investors during the bear market in the equity of Pudgy Penguin. We had Alex, who is an advisor, Alex Vanevik, the founder of, uh, mm -hmm. CEO of Nansen, who is an advisor. Mega Pudgy Penguin fan. I'm a big fan. You also said there is no second best. <laughs> there Regarding, is there is no second best. And when you meet the dude, like you, re I mean, it's so obvious, right? And also, 
because most co projects are shit, right? There's nothing behind it. So if there is one who is like, hey, let's build something, let's create actual revenue that is not crypto geek related, but it's real world related, it's going to make a massive difference. You and Luca share similar backgrounds also, kind of a difficult childhood, drop shipping, e-com, crypto, and you live in the same place, Miami. I live in Puerto Rico. He told ah, me live, okay. he, he told me go to he he told me to go to Miami, but he was one of the first guys to move to Miami before it was cool. I just decided to go a little bit more south for tax mm. purposes. <laughs> Why are you so bull bullish on Pudgy Penguins? I mean, I'm an equity shareholder in Pudgy. Uh, it was not an investment in the project. It was me betting on Luca. Mm. So Luca used to run a lot of e-commerce for a lot of top tier influencers out in LA. And he was, you know, making multiple six figures every single day. And I was able to meet a couple of the influencers that he was interacting with, talk about their e-commerce and eventually connected with Luca. We had a, in, in 2019, we had the DeFi summer. And then I remember in 2020, we were sitting in the Ritz Carlton and we were we didn't know anything about Uniswap, right? So we we're out here figuring out DeFi, shit coins, and we've been in the crypto journey since the beginning. It was February of 2021, I believe. My dates kind of get confused at this point. It's been so long. Uh, when Pancake Swap first hit twenty dollars, that's when I got. I is it is it my tattoo on this side or is it yeah, on the other on side? side? Okay, yeah. So I got the Pancake, pancake swap, swap tattoo. tattoo. <laughs> yeah, the, those motherfuckers. They blessed me. Uh, but we were we had gotten a house. We'd rented a house. In Miami, after the Ritz Carlton, uh, we bought our first NFTs there, and then we created a group chat called Crypto Island with guys from the Cayman Islands and just ballers and in crypto, and we started talking about NFTs and shit like that before it kind of became hot. And Luca posted this photo of a pudgy penguin, and he said one thing. He posted it. This is when it just launched. It was point one ETH. He posted and he said the Asian community is going to love this. Mm. And that was the thesis for him buying it. At that point, the entire crypto NFT bull run took place. Things went up, things went down. And then I get a message one day. I'm in Croatia. I get a message one day and I'm like, and it's Luke, he says, let's buy Pudgy. And I'm like, wait, what? And he's like, yeah, I just put out a tweet, 750 ETH. And I'm like, okay, sounds good. I messaged Cole as well through one of my accounts and long story short, thankfully through one of the capital club members who helped us broker the deal, we got the deal and Luca just spearheaded the project. So I gave him some so cash. You, so you bought Pudgy Penguin with him? Yeah, yeah I, I think I put in half a million dollars out of the 2.5 and because there wasn't a lot of liquidity providers and mm. we went to a lot of founders of the top projects and they didn't give a rat's ass about Luca. They didn't bet on this guy. Mm. Uh, but Luca has a background of taking IP that is undervalued and absolutely blowing it up. So uh, tossed a little bit of coin there, said Luca take it and he absolutely demolished it. But had the project gone to what I believe it's going to go to, it's a multi-billion dollar company or if it would have gone to zero, it didn't really make a difference to me. My bet was with Luca Nets and I'll continue betting on him as an individual because like you said, it's not the IP that, that matters necessarily. It's not just the NFTs. It's not even the community alone. It's the people that are carrying it, right? It's the individuals that are running the project. And when you have somebody that once again understands sales and understands marketing and distribution, which are the two keys, you win. He said the exact same during the podcast. So before when you said that, you know, if you, you can have the best project, if you don't understand distribution, marketing, and sales, it's not going to, he said the exact same, right? It was the absolute most important. In the and background no one understands that in crypto, basically. It's like because, no one... because, because, like I said, you can have a great product, but if nobody sees it, it doesn't really make a difference. Yeah. So the e comp kid came in and just absolutely took over, and it just made absolute sense. Where do you think Pudgy is going? 100 ETH. 100 ETH. Yeah, it's good. cycle? The cycle, I mean, it's just, it's, 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 you can no longer value it as an NFT company. Absolutely it, agree. It, it'll compete with the likes of Hello Kitty. It'll compete with the likes of Mickey Mouse. It'll compete with the likes of the highest IPs in the world. And you have the premium of crypto on the top, which is like all the speculation part if you're like, because th there's a bull run, there's NFT bull run. So you, you, we benefit in the good times from the act actual premium, crypto premium, which is a, uh, Pretty amazing. Is there another crypto project or community that you're super bullish on? 
Mm. That's out there today, right? Not something like super private that's, or yeah. I mean, that's out there today. My my three my four bets are very straightforward: pudgy penguins, monad, and Jupiter exchange. To me, those three are just absolute leading fire horses. Mm. They're just gonna trail, just trail the path for what it means to build high quality decentralized finance projects. What it's going to be to rebuild on top of Ethereum a good user experience for Monad, and then Pudgy Penguins, like I talked about my predictions for 2024, Pudgy Penguins will not only flip Board Ape Yacht Club, it'll make the acquisition of Artifact Studios look like a peanut mm. when it's all said and done. So in crypto, we have these crazy booms and busts, right? And when everything busts, everything busts. Like 2022 was really bad. And so... Even for me, I was complete. I had like, I was a big Luna holder. I had like seven million that turned into five dollars in two days. And so when something like that happens, and mm. I have some friends like one who had two hundred fifty mil turned into like probably five hundred dollar. When things like that happen, I mean, obviously you feel fucking stupid, and you start to wonder like, hey, like, was it all just luck? All my businesses, all my investing, all that. So you need to kind of feel the pain, right? But there is something that's really important when you're about to kind of like leave or abandon to understand it's kind of the concept. John Adams said, every problem is an opportunity in these guys. You said every problem is an opportunity and opportunity is there all the time. Can you give me an inspiring example of a moment in your life where you thought that things were over for you? But then you double down on working your ass off and later on, in hindsight, realize that in pain and problems lie the biggest opportunities. I remember when I was poor, in the pocket, not the mind. I went to a Walmart and I had to call my bank because my, my bank account had overdrafted by $16 in order to buy groceries. And it was the lowest time in my life because I felt ashamed that I, that I couldn't even afford groceries. And at that time, I could have gotten a regular job. At that time, I could have uh, said, fuck this shit, I'm going to quit. I could have said, oh, this is another person's fault. But I looked at that situation and I said, I never want to experience this ever again. And the first thing that I did was buy uh, the book, Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. Mm. And I said, I'm going to learn about the markets. And ever since then, it's been an upside. And it was that, that situation that made me feel disgusted with my current living conditions that instead of complaining, led me to change. And, you know, I would be in the bus. I would take the bus for about an hour to work. And then I would take the train for about another hour. And every single day, just learning the basics of psychology of trading. I don't do technical analysis. I, I'm purely a value-based investor and I bet on people, right? So if you look at my investment plays, it's me betting on people, dude. And I, I don't take credit for anything. I don't take credit for, for any sort of investment that I make. I just bet on winning horses and uh, sometimes they play off. So I bet on CZ, I bet on Luca, I bet on Mark Zuckerberg and mm. they don't disappoint. So in those really hard moments, it's how do you take the pain and turn it into fire in the belly, basically. You and don't have a choice, bro. <laughs> when you're at the bottom, what do you have to lose? When you have nothing to lose, you have nothing to lose. How, like, That's how, how many, how many, you, you're going to live 80 years of your life. How many years of that, of that life are you going to live broke? I want to experience wealth. I want to experience a good life. <laughs> now, I've already experienced this side of reality, the shitty stuff, having to eat ramen noodles, sleeping on couches, sleeping in my car, pressure washing basketball courts, cleaning toilets. I've done this shit. I don't want to do it for the rest of my life. I experienced it. I'm grateful for it. I'm thankful that life gave me the opportunity to learn these things. Mm. But it doesn't mean that that's what I want to live for the rest of my life. So it's not, oh, me, poor me, dude. I'm, my life has been just blessings on blessings on blessings. I'm glad I wasn't born in some country in the middle of, of, of Africa or in the Congo where I have to mine lithium out of the ground or that I'm getting bombed in the middle of nowhere because of my beliefs or 
because the United States decided that they wanted to free my country, right? So just the fact that I have the opportunity to wake up, I'm healthy, it's a blessing. And I think that the fundamental shift is two things. One is a good attitude. Wherever you see productivity, you're going to see a person with a good attitude. And the second one is gratitude. Being super grateful for what I have. When you're grateful, life is going to continue blessing you. When you're ungrateful, when you are selfish, when you are blaming others, when you're negative, pessimistic, life will simply project what you give it. So I wanted to be positive and I always believed in myself and it worked out. And in those moments that are really hard, actually, that's when you kind of, because as you said, you don't have the choice. That's when you're actually the best, like yes. the better version of yourself, because I'm not sure about the expression in English, but in French we say you basically... Say it in French. Le, le mur. You have basically your back against the wall, right? Which means you have no other option. And so when you have no other option, because there is no other option, you make it work. And that's why I really encourage my friends who are like, hey, I have this job, but I want to start this company. Just take the leap. Because when you take the leap, you have no other option. Like the, the, as long as you keep your job and you have this money coming in, like you have the option, right, of failure. Whereas when you start, it's like, okay, now I, we, we always say take the leap and the net will appear. You have to build your plane while you're falling, right? Otherwise, you're going to crash on the floor. And it's really in those moments that the best shit happens. In those moments that you turn these really bad moments and where, 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 where the opportunity, um, uh, where, where the problem is an opportunity in these guys. It's exactly that. And, and, and you know, I was talking with the, the former president, uh, the, the son of the former president of Singapore, last name Ong, and obviously he comes from wealth. He comes from a family that has been able to uh, really educate him. And he said, every problem is an opportunity. And it's how you see the situation that determines the action that you're going to attach to it. Are you going to see a problem and be like, well, I can't change? Or are you going to see it and be like, hmm, I can do something about it? Where there's problems, there's profit. And where there's problems, there's business. And if you can identify that, you can make a whole lot of money. We talk about business, making a lot of money. Obviously, we need to talk about women. Because you have really interesting takes on women. So the first question is, in relation to making money, are women a hindrance for men to, be, to become rich? The wrong woman, yes. The right woman will empower you. She will fuel you. She will inspire you. And she'll push you towards becoming a better version of yourself. I've only been with one woman my entire life. I'm still with her. I've been over 10 years. She was with me when I had nothing. She would drive me to work. I had no car. Uh, so when I started having things or, you know, I got everything that I wanted and I became somebody, how could I let her go? You know, so she believed in me. She trusted me when I had nothing and she valued me when I was poor and insignificant and now that I've achieved some sort of success and in, in some way shape or form it's uh only fair that I bring her along for the journey so my perspective is very simple find individuals that will empower you and if you can find a, a partner that loves you for who you are but also empowers you to become a better version of yourself stick close to that person be loyal be honest be kind be authentic and keep those people around because there's not too many people in life that are going to want the best for you. And if you can't find a good woman, if you can't find a good partner, it's usually a reflection of you because you attract people. And if you attract poor people, well, it's most likely a condition of you. If you attract hoes, it's most likely a reflection of you. So if you need to, or you can't find somebody of high caliber, of high quality that, that polishes you, stay away from it. I, it's funny, I was, I was <laughs> going back to Meow. He was like, he I was asking me today, he's like, should, should I be dating a ton of girls? I'm like, no, just like find, find one person that just empowers you 
and elevates you and stick true to that individual. Now, it's different philosophies for different people. Anybody can do whatever they, they want. But for me, it worked out extremely well. And it all comes down, for, and I'm not married, but it all comes down by one thesis. Uh, there's a verse in the Bible that says, he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. Not he that findeth a woman that has the potential to be a good wife, mm. but he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing and finds pl- uh, and finds pleasure or finds uh, uh, honor in the eyes of God. So you also begin to study uh, wise men throughout history, and most of them were corrupted by women. So I understand how tempting it can be. But I also understand that if you find people that can empower you, can take you to the top. So what was your advice to Mew? Because especially in today's world, and that's something that Andrew talks about, which is as a man, right? The game is very different. As a woman, you can... I wouldn't say as a woman, the dating game is easier. It's much easier to get the guys you want, but then it's not easy to keep them and to see who is full of shit or who is really serious, right? As a man, it's kind of harder because most of the women, they go from for the top, you know, 5% or 10%, 1% men. And so for a man, it's more about how you build kind of respect, right? How do you build your personal brand and how do you build your life so that women respect you and you attract them instead of the opposite, having to chase them? I agree. Uh, Especially if you're building things, you don't have time to date like crazy. It's impossible. Yeah. Like yeah, it's I agree. just that two time. It's a job in itself. Just dating around. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's imagine, imagine you have to entertain 10 women. Like that's a, that's a lot of maintenance. <laughs> it's not, it's like, it's like having to entertain a, a 10 multiple different things. It's, it can be for you. Like if you can handle it, so be it. That's what your cup of tea. That's when you enjoy it. Perfect. But for me, it's just not, it's not an ethos that I've operated or that I've enjoyed. And I've talked to Andrew about it. We haven't talked in a while, but I've talked to him about it. I was like, hey, when, when are you going to settle with one girl? And we chuckled about it. We laughed about it when I was out in Romania. But um, yeah, he, he has a different perspective about it. It's totally fair. He's become highly successful with his philosophy of life. So hmm. uh, mine just is a little bit different, but to each their own. Yeah. What should be the priority for a man? Taking care of your, fa- of your family, wife and children, or pursuing your mission at the cost of not seeing the ones you love and care for? Live a life of balance. Why not both? Why not both? Why not, you know, divide your time into the things, all the things that you enjoy? Why not divide your time and your attention into multiple areas of life that are valuable to you? If, you know, you didn't have a good father, well, you have the opportunity to become a good father, you know? If you had siblings that took care of you and empowered you when you had nothing, bring them along for the journey, right? If your mom is not retired, what the fuck are you doing driving a Lamborghini, you know? <laughs> so, so it's all about perspective, you know? There's priorities and different people have different priorities, but I think that there is a, a, a novelty in finding balance and understanding that there is a beauty of sharing success with your family. There's a beauty of seeing your family winning with you. And even though they may not help in the sense of your business, they took care of you for fucking so long. You owe it to them to give them a great life. And yeah, I think you can have both. That's that. And I, and I'm a living testament of it. You know, I, my parents, I, I pay their salary. You know, my, my parents work within my organization. They're basically retired. I'm not going to retire them. Oh, just, go do go play bingo all day they don't want that they want to be involved in in what we do they want to be involved in the ecosystem they want to see us develop so why not take care of them and i think that there is a beautiful balance in taking care of your friends taking care of your family taking care of your loved ones and still pursuing your dreams and your goals i don't think that you have to sacrifice one or the other to have the other what do you think about um the more kind of materialist, materialistic side of things, watches. I mean, I know you really like watches, cars, all that stuff. Do you think it's, it's a moment that everyone who kind of like builds wealth has to go through to realize, oh man, Luca was saying the same actually. He was like, oh man, I'm so fucking stupid. I bought this car there. It made no sense. Like what's your view on that? It all depends on what you enjoy. You know, I, I kind of went into the watch 
game after NFTs because I was like, oh, cool. Like I can start collecting. I got interested in the space. I, I kind of had some boys that, that were reselling watches. So I built a $1.25 million watch collection, but I only wear two of the watches. So it's like, I'm there sitting and I'm like, it was it a little bit of a waste that I, mm-hmm. that I have all these watches sitting in the vault? Did I like, okay, it's, it's a good investment. Yeah, that's cool. But do I need these things? And then I, I have a million dollar Pokemon collection. I'm like, okay, like, what the fuck am I doing with the Pokemon collection? And then I bought a $4 million house. And I'm like, there's people coming into my house every single day. And, and I have gardeners and I have cleaners and it feels like a hotel. So I sold the house. Mm. And then I was like, I want to be light in baggage. I want to be able to move. I want to have that flexibility. So I started getting rid of a lot of my material possessions to simply be able to free up my mental real estate. Because when I had I had a small fleet of cars, I got rid of them because maintenance, focusing on making sure that they're taken care of. Same thing with the real estate. I think real estate is a great investment vehicle, but I don't want to manage properties. I don't want to have to worry about maintenance. Yeah, other people can do that for sure, but it's just not my cup of tea. I want to be light of baggage. I want to be able to be free flowing. I like to travel the world. I like to stay in hotels. Like I like to be free. And that means that sometimes material possessions hold you down from achieving great things. So I want to stay away from things that I really don't need. Miyamoto, Miyamoto Musashi famously said, get rid of things that are of no use. So if something doesn't serve you anymore, and maybe it served you in the past, you don't have to be attached to that thing. Mm. And so if he says, and he, he, he's, he's a great samurai philosopher, but he says, don't do things that are of no use. And I begin to explore that philosophy and I begin to only do the things that are useful. And I begin to not realize that my success is attached to materialistic things. They don't determine me. They don't determine my identity. Yeah, I understand the perspective of playing the game. You know, you you sit down, you have a $50,000 watch. Somebody may look at you in, in a different way. Mm-hmm. But I've never sat across from a billionaire and I've sat down across six and they look at my watch and be like, ah, I want to do, I want to listen to this guy because of what he's wearing or what he's doing. Most of them, you could see him walking down the street and you wouldn't even recognize them as billionaires. Very low key. Absolutely. The, the most successful people, super low key. Because, because they have nothing to prove. Absolutely. You know, I, one, of my, one of my business partners, uh, we have a crypto fund, and he invested in Bitcoin sub $1, 2011. He's, <laughs> but he dresses like a bum, you know, and he's my boy, but he has nothing to prove. Mm-hmm. And, and you look how he, yeah, how he travels, very light, very simple, easygoing. And that just shows a level of confidence that money does buy. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's a level of confidence that money actually buys, but you see it exemplified through the simplicity of life. And Leonardo da Vinci famously said, which is one of my favorite quotes of all time, he said, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Being able to simplify Absolutely. your life in such an incredible way that it's so easy To live. I think there is this meme that I saw the other day. It's so funny. It's basically poor, no car, Mid- middle class, average car, rich, Lambo, wealthy, no car. Basically, it's exactly that, right? And so you kind of, and the, the, the common topic that I have with most people who come on this podcast who made Most of them, they made hundreds of millions or billions. And they're super humble, super chill. And most of them, they went through this kind of like entire loop, right? Or this kind of like life round tripping or happiness round tripping, which is, hey, I thought I needed all that stuff. I'm building towards that. I'm making all this money just to realize that it's back to like the basic things. And it might sound like a cliche or, oh yeah, the basic the basic things make you happy, but if you can't be happy with a coffee, you're not going to be, uh, um, with, you're not going to be happy with a jet. Right. So it's just like all these people making the same realization that at the end of the day, yes, obviously you want to have a minimum amount of money, which we talked about before. We all have goals based on our lifestyle and all that stuff. Right. But there isn't a threshold or a certain amount above which doesn't make any difference. And happiness will never come from that. Mm. 
Yeah, and also understanding that it's not just happiness, but your identity isn't attached to those mm. to those things. And you know, sometimes I talk about like my crypto losses, you know, but my identity isn't even attached to my crypto losses. It's not attached to my crypto wins. It's not attached to my investment wins or my investment losses. What I have, what I don't have. It's simply, am I pursuing my fullest potential? Am I being authentic with myself? Am I an actual person that is that is true to my values? And it goes back to what I said in the beginning, when it's all said and done, I'm laying on my deathbed. Can I look at myself individually and say, you did well, you, you succeeded, you didn't compromise your values. There's a verse that says, what does a man prosper if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Mm. Nothing. So I don't want to gain everything and lose myself in the process. And I think that there's a massive virtue in accomplishing that. And that's why I don't attach my identity to my wins, to my losses. I'm just trying to experience life. I'm trying to learn like everybody else. We're all on this, we're all on this planet trying to figure things out. And if we can be authentic, that none of us have it all figured out. We're all just trying to play this game the best we can. Then you can walk with a little bit more graciousness, a little bit more truth, and be light of baggage and focus on pursuing your fullest potential. Maybe as a good wrap up, what's your biggest fuck up? In crypto or in life? I'd say life fuck up. <laughs> There's so many. <laughs> That's a good yeah, answer. They, they keep That's flashing. Good <laughs> they keep flashing. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, this I could have, oh no, I could have, I, I could have bought Bitcoin at cheaper price. I could have not sold the Bitcoin. I, I got fucked with this play. I, yeah, but at the end of the day, bro, it's, I'm just happy to be alive. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Um, I'm grateful to be here and I look forward to part two somewhere Amazing. around the world. Thank you so much, man. You're not just an entrepreneur, but you're a role model for many. And our generation obviously needs more role models like you. So from all of them and from, for, from our listeners, I'd like to thank you for what you're doing, for putting yourself out there. As you said before, you know, talking truth comes with a lot of criticism and even maybe some threats. And you, you still do it, right, without caring about all the threats and criticism that come with it. So Because it's the price, brother. All of them, Aristotle's, Plato, all the greats were once revered as fools. They were burned at the stake. They were laughed at. They were even crucified. And that's the price you have to pay for the exploration of truth. And that's the price you have to pay to unplug people from the bullshit system. And if I got to take a couple arrows for the team, so fucking be it. Wow. Thank you for reading this tonight, man. It was an absolute hell of a conversation. Absolutely, bro. Thank you. Awesome. Cool.